but there was one Jamaican whose music combined a rude boy image with Rasta consciousness in a way no other artist had. He would take Britain and the world by storm. At last, there was a reggae star who would be promoted as a hit maker and as an artist. Marley, the importance of Marley on the black British youth, it's almost impossible to put into words. I mean, I saw him play, and it was like a religious experience. I mean, my top gig of all time, and walked out there a new man, a reinvented man, because we saw somebody here that was being accepted on his terms. You know, no straightened hair, you know, no speaking English. It was his way or the highway. I think Bob Marley probably had the most impact of any artist um, on us collectively as a group of mates, you know. We, we went to see him and that to me was the closest thing to a spiritual experience I'd had. He was, uh, he was incredible. The band were brilliant, the Whalers were great, but, but he was something special. Today they say that we are free, only to be tamed in poverty. The Whalers had been together as a trio since the mid-60s, but now they were about to transform the British reggae scene. It was probably the most important event in my life. I felt we should position him more as a rock act, as a black rock act. And in so doing, I wanted to move the music away from being its raw reggae into having some elements which I felt would pull in the people who are interested in, in rock music, that kind of music. Catch a Fire's original Jamaican tapes were adapted for the rock market by Chris Blackwell, who overdubbed American musicians onto the recordings. They started playing this strange music. I mean, I'd never heard the likes of. It was so... Uh, Compared to anything else I'd ever heard in my life, everything, uh, the R&B, the church music, anything I'd ever, ever heard, um, this was backwards. And Bob uh, had his guitar on, and he was going chick it, chick it like they do, and uh, and I was just meandering on the organ like. You know, and he said, no, no, no. Bumble clot, rat clot, all this, you know. So I made it a chord and went. It's what he could teach you about his music that helped you with your own music. For my generation that bought the album, not only did we not know that Blackwall did that and there was an original Roots version, we didn't care. It was those things that made our ears prick up and go, wow, this is someone that's really doing something different. <laughs> Blackwell still needed the help of a major rock star to get Marley's music to the mainstream that reggae had not yet touched. Now at that time, there was no bigger artist in England, and maybe the world, than, than Eric Clapton. And when Eric Clapton picked some material from Bob Marley, that, that I think was probably Bob's biggest break. The 
rock audience was becoming aware of reggae. And the record business wondered whether other British bands would grab this opportunity to reach a new audience. The fledgling black reggae bands found themselves in the shadow of Marley's music, and they faced skeptical fans who were now looking for an authentic sound. We had a split audience. We had the slightly older generation that looked to Jamaica. And then we had the British audience who was still in a flux as to whether they looked towards the Caribbean, which was authentic, or looked at what was happening on the doorstep. The Young Roots band sharpened their musical skills in local bars and clubs. At the same time, we're rehearsing every week, hoping that the band's successful. Meanwhile, the parents have uh, no interest in music at all. They had their share of musical snobbery and prejudice to overcome as well. Lots of people were um, hurling criticism at reggae. Oh, you just have to know how to play two chords and you're there. Right, which a lot of reggae has been two chords, but, you know, two of the sweetest chords you could, you know, put together. We were more interested in, you know, trying to fuse a pop style with the soul style 